Uh, <laughs> Mavis Mullins, the uh, ultimate marketer. <laughs> Excellent. Hey, uh, this is a really interesting um, session, I guess for all Indigenous peoples, but uh, for New Zealanders, given that we are a food basket per se, uh, this is a really important topic for us. And great that Carrie Joe, the previous presenter, gave us such a good insight uh, that made me feel somewhat more comfortable that the issues that they are facing, we are facing, in fact, all of us are probably facing. So I just wanted to summarise some of the key points that she made, because that'll feed into our discussion. Um, I loved her line that food doesn't equal nutrition. You can't simply throw money at the problem, uh, supplying uh, our people bulk food and expect that's going to be good for them. And that's a really important concept. Food is not nutrition. Uh, but you also talked about the food sector and what it provides for our people. So it's not just food, it's about jobs. Uh, it's about strengthening our communities. Uh, she talked about the supply chain issues that are faced in getting food uh, developed and grown and moved to market or moved to our people in remote areas. Uh, then she talked about the financial infrastructure of the food sector, uh, the raising of capital and the struggle that our smaller entities who are entering the marketplace, the struggles that they will have with getting sufficient capital to run their business and get themselves up and running. She also uh, suggested there may be some discussion around, and we've had this discussion in New Zealand, do we create separate systems for our indigenous food systems or do we strengthen and grow the existing systems we've got? And that's a, that's a bit of an ongoing uh, discussion, especially around that collaboration piece. Um, and she also was very clear that this is a sector that would really benefit from having our young people bringing our young rangatahi or our leaders, our youth through to be rangatira or leaders of industry. Um, and so there's a great opportunity there. The discussion around the cost of food safety, not just the cost of food safety, but all the processes and the regulations that are required. Um, and even more so now, you know, with uh, the COVID situation, the health requirements, the double down, uh, that cost gets fed right along to the producers. And so that's something we need to be thinking of constantly. And a lot of what you talked about is something that, that I deal with on a daily basis as the director at New Zealand Trade and Enterprise. How do we power up our ethnic communities? How do we power up our new businesses, our young people? How do we get them into this marketplace? How do we get quality food uh, to the world and to our people? But before we go into how we do that, I'd like to introduce each one of the presenters. And in fact, I'm not going to introduce you. I'd like you to Tell us a bit about who you are and uh, the business background you come from. Mavis, kia koe. Um, kei te mihi nui kia koutou. Um, greetings and uh, lovely to be here. Ko Mavis Mullins a hou. My name is Mavis. Kei te uri a hou, uh, a rangi tāne, a te hau nui a paparangi and ngāti rangi nui. So I'm a granddaughter, a mukapuna of the people of rangi tāne, a te hau nui a paparangi and ngāti rangi nui. I sit here today as the chair of the Atiho Wanganui Incorporation. We live under the Korowai of um, Mount Ruapehu, right in the centre of the North Island. We farm there, we have uh, 100,000 acres somewhat, around about that, and on those land blocks we farm something like 200,000 stock units, sheep, beef, dairy, we have 3,000 hives, bees up the, up the very remote Whanganui River, and we have forestry and, of course, carbon credits. And of late, we've been delving into horticulture, so blueberries, and we do this on behalf of 9,000 shareholders. These are people of our whānau hapu, so it is a family business, an extended family business, and uh, we have very active participants of those families in the business of Atiho Wanganui. Which is an ideal opportunity, an example of collaboration amongst our people. That's really cool. Sam Mihua, kia ora. Kia ora te whanau, ngā puke kahaura ki ka tarehu, e mei ana ki te whenua, e tangi ana ki te tangi after. Ke moe hau kei waho, ko te aroha kei uta, ko tūkapa te mōna, ko haura ki te whenua, ko maru tua hau te tangata. Uh, that's just my little calling card because I'm from the hauraki and we're very proud of that space, so just thought I'd throw it out here. Um, my name's Samuel Mikaere and I'm the manahautu or the CEO at Waiu Dairy. And uh, Waiu is a uh, Māori-owned dairy industry that um, was comprised of 11 uh, Māori entity within 
the uh, Eastern Bay of Plenty, uh, along with one of our um, Japanese uh, supporters. So um, yeah, uh, we're here today to speak on behalf of, of the dairy space and our kind of trials and tribulations that we've come across as being a Māori business working in a um, uh, mainstream you know, area selling products in the same markets. Kia ora. Kia ora, Sam. Paddy. Kia ora. Kia ora, <laughs> um, kia ora koutou. Uh, ko Paddy Mason tuku ingoa. Ko Taki Timbi te waka. Ko te maipi te maunga. Ko kaua te te awa. Ko nai te maupihi a rangi te hapu. Ko nā te kainunu ki wararapa tuku iwi. Uh, kia ora. Um, my name's Paddy Mason. Um, sort of the proud owner of two indigenous, 100% Māori owned businesses in the Wairarapa in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm here on behalf of uh, Support Te Aratini, but um, uh, our iwi, our whanau, uh, I. We're all New Zealand Manuka Honey. Um, it's, a, it's a business that we created um, for Fano, really, which was based on on values and um, upskilling our Fano, which was, you know, um, that's what we're about, Fano order, uh, which is involves, you know, as many Fano, iwi community as we can. Um, yeah. Thank you, Sandra. Back to you. Yeah, thank you, Paddy. Uh, you've just highlighted a very important thing. I want you all to think about and, and come up with where you think your organisations prosper because you're a Māori business and because you have Indigenous philosophy around your business uh, practices. So maybe if I can ask you that first. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I did bring this up. So this is our why. So this is the Atiho Wanganui logo. This has been developed from stories of old, from old carvings in our whare nui. And what you often find in those carvings are the fingers like this that intersect. And often those fingers intersect across the puku. So it's a protection me mechanism. So afi is a Māori word that means to embrace. It also means as the hands are across the puku, it is a protector of the next life because that's where our future comes from. This is the protector of the new world, our new, our new generation coming through. So when you have very strong whys, that are based on the stories of old, those are the things that can take you forward. Mm. And I guess yesterday, Dr. Hinamore Elder talked about our pepiha, these stories enable us to be time travellers. And so for Atio Wanganui as a business, that is what grounds us, those values. And it is about how we embrace not just the products, but our land, our animals, and then ultimately our customers. So there's a very strong uh, sense of ownership, of manaki, of looking after, of embracing, that sits all the way through our products from the soils, from the land, all the way to our customers. Beautifully explained. Thank you for that, Mavis. Uh, Sam, you and I have been involved literally from the ground up with the growth of Waiu Dairy, literally from putting the, 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 the foundations in for your processing plant. Um, you, you, you've got a unique relationship there working amongst different tribal groups, different investors who have brought money on the table. You've got farmers from across your area bringing the product in for supply. Can you tell us a bit about what it means to you to be representing and leading that type of group um, and, and how you feel that strengthens that community that hasn't had that opportunity until now? No, um, <clears throat> it's a good, good question. Uh, one of the things we love about uh, working with our community and being a Māori-based and Māori-value organisation is that we can, um, we can work in the mainstream, but we need to develop tools that allow us to stay online with that. 
and including when you're dealing with our farming groups or our shareholders or the people at work, it's, uh, it's challenging. So we've actually gone about indigenizing our entire process, so trying to have a complete or Māori uh, aligned with our value set that we've created, working closely with the shareholders. And what it does is it allows us to say, well, if we want to look at farming, for example, we put the lens across it, and that lens looks at it from Māori, um, Māori perspective, and then we can say, well, how does this align with what we're doing? And then we can make some adjustments, and we've, we've created our kaitiaki program from that, which is using Fakaro Māori to develop farming structures, but it then take it to that level to make sure it caters to more than just what we're doing. When we're working with our people, we want to make sure that they... Um, our HRM systems, our human resource systems are set up in a way that values our old people's ways. So we take tikanga and we, we, we implement it into our system and then we develop that for um, how we want to work with our people. So instead of having someone, for example, steal product, uh, you know, sometimes it happens in business. We don't say you're no longer of value. We say, well, how do we bring you and your whanau back in so that we can keep you and make you a valuable member of this whanau and continue to use that? We don't want to put the stigma across there that says, uh, you are bad because of this. People make decisions, and, and, and as a Māori organisation, we try to make sure that we keep them with us. And then when it comes to customers, we also apply their lens. We, we really value customers that want to look beyond three to five years, that want to look into inter intergenerational. Um, so having our whole entire value set defined and then using that as a lens, we cut across everything we do in a, in a mainstream business because we do have to work with customers, we do have to work with... Um, suppliers and such. We just want to make sure that we've got that tool equipped to help us develop it. And that brings the shareholders along because they can input into how we develop those values and what kaupapa, what um, whakatauaki we use in our space, what, you know, what the tikanga we develop, we, we try to make sure that that Eastern Bay is represented strongly. You've used the word tikanga two or three times, mm. uh, our indigenous protocols or understandings. Uh, Paddy, to you, you're working uh, in a sector that has got over 200 manuka honey producers and exports across Aotearoa, New Zealand. How do you find uh, that you are in a, when you're in a, a sector that is some Māori, well, mostly Māori, but they're also non-Māori, how do you think that the Māori cultural belief system, or tikanga, how do you think that strengthens your business and how does that enable you to work more collaboratively across that really crowded sector? That's a good question. You know, um, I think for us as a business, Māori, true Māori business, is the point of difference and what makes us different to everybody else. And I believe the way our values are structured with our tikanga, our whakawhanaungatanga, our manakitanga, um, our hauora, you know, our hauora is big too. It's about the, the well-being of, um, of our whānau. Yeah our employers, our bees, um, and the sustainability of, um, of the, hun you know, the honey industry. It's creating, um, the, making it sustainable so we can employ our own whanau, our community, and our iwi. But actually, through our tikanga values, is to make sure that it's sustainable for the future as well. Yeah. yeah, we talk uh, in New Zealand about uh, creating something for our people, our children, our children's children, intergenerational growth. So uh, as a culture, we tend to think long term. And in fact, there's one company in New Zealand has a 500 year strategic plan. So now turning to the future and the fact that we do have these long run ideas and what's coming forward for our people. Um, Sam, what do you think the future holds for, uh, I guess, the dairy sector, because you've been in the sector with other organisations, in fact, with our biggest organisation in New Zealand, but now you're in a Māori sector and you're dealing in organic milk. Uh, can you tell us why you went to organic milk and what that paints for a future for your industry? Yeah, I really wish you had asked Mavis that question. Um, <laughs> no, it's because you can have a go at you. It's a good question. Um, <laughs> look, I think when we look, when we look into the future, uh, <clears throat> everything we do is really about saying, well, how many more jobs are we going to create? And I know this isn't the direct answer, but we'll, when we make these decisions, it's like, well, what do we do to create stability and value? How do we continue to educate our people and create more jobs and opportunities for our people, um, which I'm proud to say at our business, for example, we have 85% of our staff are Māori. Um, the, 
it makes it easier to make your decisions because then when you put that lens across it, you're like, well, how do we stay in the dairy business? Now, if you look across the, the spectrum um, in dairy right now, everything is moving towards higher value. Now, we don't have a large plant. Our whole co-pop is about being niche. So then you look at the opportunities that align and, and you see, well, organics is actually something that is, you know, had our old people have been around, that's exactly what it is. Uh, you know, they, were, they knew how to do things back in the old ways and organics kind of has a similar facado. They, they like to do things, you know, with our tantalized posts. They like to make sure they're using all the natural plants and extracts around there to either create a product of animal or to protect it. So we thought organic really aligned um, perfectly with where we are. And our goal and ambition is to grow our organic um, farmers that right now are about 40% organic. We want to go that to 100%. But then while we're in the organic space, we also want to look at things like, well, how do we um, collaborate with other Māori entities, um, grab other Māori products that are coming out and create something for the mainstream? Because it's not just about creating value for our people, it's about taking our value to other people. Mm. And, and I mean that both not just in a materialistic way, but also in the kaupapa that we drive. So my, our ultimate ambition is create higher-end value products, get into that higher-end protein space, develop all these new kind of uh, ways to consume and to take health and well-being from dairy, but then also look at alternative options and hopefully while doing that, creating more jobs, more education, more opportunity, and, um, you know, just lifting the bay and our people as we go through it and stretching our um, kaupapa across the entire country and trying to work with Māori in the dairy space. Cool. Mavis, I look at your uh, organisation, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the batting order was beef and lamb and trees You've now added honey and got berries. So to a certain extent, you are future-proofing your organisation by diversifying your product line. What do you see in the, in the, in the distant future? Where, where do you think AFI is heading and what does that look like for your people? There's a couple of things that I think about. Um, the first one is, you know, and this was part of the corridor uh, for this, this discussion around Indigenous food systems. Mm. Well, what we know up the river, Whanganui, we stretched from the mountain to the river to the sea. And each of those segments of our rohe had seasonal product. So there was a lot of trading amongst ourselves, which creates resilience, doesn't it? Yes. You know, so you're not just all dependent on one product. So there's that kind of whakaro that we're also trying to embrace. How do we ensure that no matter what time of the year, that there is a food system available because that was something done of old. The other thing that we've been quite deliberate in is our actual value practice. So we export red meat up into the US. We went up there for the first time, I think it might have been about two, two and a half, three years ago. But when we went, it was a very deliberate strategy that we visited the local indigenous people the local band, we found them, we went to see them, they thought we wanted to do a deal. We were really going to say to them, we're at your place, we want you to know that we're here, we want you to know what we're doing, and hopefully you approve of our activity in your backyard. You know, now that was a, a, quite a groundbreaking thing for them, yep. and it was groundbreaking for us as well. So, you know, when you take your those principles and values and practices and bring them into that commercial sector, you know, they just, it just has a profound effect. Yeah, that's, it, it, and it's great to see that link to other Indigenous groups. And I guess if we are looking at the future for Indigenous people in the food sector, it's about collaboration, not just within our own, but with other entities, other uh, parts of the world, uh, and eventually we will obviously take over the rest of the world. And that's the plan, right? Um, Paddy, you're in a relatively new sector with Manuka honey. And one of the uh, elements of concern for the future for all in the food sector is intellectual property. Uh, as we uh, innovate in the sector and create new food sources and protein sources, uh, we will need to be so careful around that intellectual property. We know that this has been an issue for the Manuka honey sector. Right now, it's in litigation. Um, how do you think that is affecting your sector? And how is it, uh, what are you as a sector thinking of as a means of mitigating any of that potential risk to your intellectual property? Yeah, I think that battle between Australia and New Zealand is going to go on for many years. But um, for us as Māori, um, 
we have a tonga, you know, and the opportunity is we want to share it with the world. You know, there's certification and um, um, that we need to make sure that uh, we can trade, you know, outside of New Zealand or share it with other indigenous groups. Yeah. Intellectual property is of some concern. I know you, yeah. you, you're nodding furiously, Mavis. What are your, your view on this? No, well, with Paddy, uh, what we have seen is Māori pulling together, haven't we, in terms of how we do protect our name, our Manuka name. Uh, so this is a place where, you know, this is a place we own, eh? and we've been quite strident in ensuring that our voice is heard and that our hand sits firmly over those names, those products, that flora and fauna that are ours. Yeah, I look at it, it's a challenge for all indigenous populations around the world because internationally, uh, no country has given indigenous uh, intellectual property rights to first genus of any species. And New Zealand, we're, we're that close to cracking that one. That's right. And that will be a watershed moment for indigenous people globally because it will give them hope that we can all own that intellectual property of those sources that we created as Indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge opportunity that the Y262 claim is working towards helping us with. So fingers crossed on that. Hey, I just want to read you something that I, I got on it last night and um, I get regular releases on what's happening in the food sector. Uh, retails, this is from Kansas City in the US. Retail sales of fresh and frozen plant-based meat alternatives are decelerating at a rapid rate. After two years of category sales growth, with 2020 uh, buoyed and almost doubled into 2021, they're now showing rapid deceleration. They're giving three reasons for this, Fano. Um, the first is the consumer not perceiving the product to be clean. The second one, uh, they're not sure if they are more sustainable than the conventional farming and producing methods. And the third one is that the meat industry is fighting back uh, with a greater marketing campaign. So if you think of two of those three, okay, so in any open market situation, you're going to have uh, the incumbent launch a marketing plan to keep their market share. But when we talk about the two items that are listed in this, one is around trusting the product that it's clean. And the second one is, uh, is it created in a more sustainable manner. So we know, we talked about it yesterday, we've talked about it today, that it's the story that is really important, telling the right stories about our products. What are you, what are you thinking, um, Sam, when you look at that as an example, when you want to future-proof your products, how do, you, how do you put the consumer at ease around the cleanliness of the product and about the sustainability of the product? Mm. It's, a, it's a good one because we, for example, YU has just recently completed its FSSC 22000, which is an international certification of quality. So one of the things we've done is actually use the international standard to put that on our bag so that when it goes into market, people can't question the quality or the, you know, the goodness of the product. Um, we also did it as one of where the, it's quite an interesting part, but our business was one of the first to take it on in the Māori space. And we completed it faster than any other uh, business in New Zealand, so we were the fastest to ever qualify, which we thought was a really great thing, and it was very much a lot of work in the background. So when you go into markets, you want to protect yourself. The other side, though, is um, I often find you mentioned the marketing thing, and businesses are fighting back. Well, it's also marketing that makes people think it's not good. Yeah. And so when you're using the uh, the fear of the foreign or um, the fear of the unknown or that yours is not as good as ours. Um, all we can do is really put forth what we are and make that well known to people. And so um, <clears throat> trying to have that marketing support yourself and having yourself prepared for those stories when you go into market, because you will get pulled off the shelf immediately and, and if you're new, but um, sorry, you will not pulled, you will go onto the shelves if you get in there, but the thing is staying there. And once you get to the top, it's very hard to, um, to stay there and not be challenged by others. So the part we do is we make sure that when we're putting stuff into market, we understand what the protocol is and what the certification is and how we can protect our brand. But then the second part is to make sure that our processes are aligned and that we don't lose sight of why we're trying to go to that place. It's not always about the money, it's actually about creating uh, a product that is using our values and that seems to fit for our, for our customers in those markets who value those things. 
Now, our people out here might think that Mavis is actually quite happy that plant-based protein is not making the moves it is, but I understand you and I have talked about this. You've also considered how you can move into this market as well. So what are your thoughts about um, the alternative protein market and your opportunity and also how you keep your product to the forefront? So the first thing is our natural product has to be the absolute best it can be. So our animals have to be the happiest their whole lives. Our waterways have to be the cleanest forever. Our soils have to be deep and nourishing forever. So that's the first thing. Excellent. The second thing is alternative foods are never going to go away. Mm. You know, we need to feed a world and there is a cost to that. We did look at, at some point, investing in um, a New Zealand company that was producing um, alternative food, and I'm not going to call it meat because it's not, uh, out of peas. And we thought, we have land, perhaps we could grow the peas for them. Uh, but unfortunately, the genetics that they need isn't able to be grown in New Zealand, so they were having to purchase offshore, bring it in, process it. Well, that's how sustainable is that? You know, it's not there yet. We're not blind to the fact that this is real mm. and it's coming, but that makes us even more determined that what we do on the land has to be, without question, mm. the best. Mm. Great point to finish on, and uh, as a lifelong vegetarian, I, I don't qualify for my Māori card, <laughs> uh, but as a lifelong vegetarian, I get somewhat uh, hoha or bored with, this is just like beef, and this is just like chicken. I don't remember what chicken ever tasted like, oh. and I don't think uh, people eating food sources today want to know that it looks like beef. They actually want a good product. Yeah. So the sooner we take off that mindset that says you've got to copy something else and create a quality product in its own right, um, and if we look at that properly, that is a real future for all our Indigenous peoples and our growth opportunities across the world. Um, Nareri Huama, thank you so much for your conversation this afternoon. The future of food is a huge topic because it brings in jobs, it brings in social, it brings in communities, it brings in health, environment and safety, and it brings in an opportunity for all our Indigenous people around the world to fully participate in this particular sector. Thank you so much. Kia Uh, mihi ana ki a tātou. Uh, kore te rauru o ngā mihini o te 